Hi, I'm Jenny Shampo, the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and I'm here today with Margaret Olson Hemming. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Margaret is the co-author of The Book of Mormon for the Least of These, Volumes 1 through 3, and she's currently the art editor for Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, and she sits on the advisory board for the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. She was recently named as the incoming co-editor of Dialogue starting in 2025. Is that right? 25? Mm -hmm. And she uh, was formerly um, an editor of, um, or the editor of Exponent 2. Um, and she's also a graduate student of theology at Duke Divinity School in North Carolina. Um, today, we're looking at the scriptures in 3 Nephi 27 to 4 Nephi. And the artwork is by Megan Riker. It's called Mother Tell Me. Uh, it's a painting from 2018. Uh, so Margaret, I just, I wanna ask first, what does Nephite society look like in these chapters? What's going on? And, and how does this artwork try to visualize this moment in Nephite history? This is sort of the, the the peaceful apex of the Book of Mormon story, right? The the moment where peace actually holds for more than uh, five or 10 years, which is, you know, the rest of the Book of Mormon, when it describes a period of peace, acts more of, more of like a ceasefire where people aren't mm -hmm. actively killing each other, but they're still hating each other and they're still preparing for the next battle. This is a period where they're actually living in what Martin Luther King would call a positive peace, right? So people are thriving. They are supporting one in, one each one another. They are um, living not only with a lack of violence, but they are building a beloved community mm -hmm. of, um, of believers and also leaving behind their names that have caused so much division or or helped perpetuate so much division right, right. so this is not just nephites uh history or lamanites uh history but they've given up their names and they're living um as one in mm -hmm. unity and yeah. um, the scripture and, says right there are no ites yeah. of any kind yeah right? exactly no ites and no poor among them mm -hmm. and there's there's really no other time um in the book of mormon where that where that happens so we have Jesus coming, and then in his wake, you know, they finally learn to lay down their weapons of war and and love one another for this period. And the the text itself is not very long. Um, you know, fourth Nephi, you just kind of breeze through like 500 years of history. Um, but the the importance of the text is some of the most important chapters, I think, mm -hmm. of the Book of Mormon. And uh, and unfortunately, we don't get a lot of of information about how this how they manage to achieve this peace and live with one another um, for so many generations. Mm -hmm. um, but I think sitting with that and considering what that kind of peace would look like in our own world is is critically important. Um, so in this piece, what, how, how does this relate to other images that might be based on this time period in the scriptures? Um, or how does it fit into larger, the larger context of LDS art? What's different about it or what's similar? So I would say two things um, that are related to each other. One is that it's not depicting a clear moment in the text. Yeah. That is, there, there's not a... Um, there's not a verse in which you can say, okay, here is Mormon standing before the crowd and, you know, he's got the title of liberty above him and this is that moment. Mm -hmm. Instead, this is kind of an idea of um, a moment that may have happened. Yeah. Um, and, and so in that way, it's kind of reading into the text and it's sitting with the text in a different way um, and thinking of... Um, who are all of the people who are unnamed in the text? Mm. Um, and, and how did this time period, how did they live their lives in this time period, even if the text doesn't name them? But it's sort of, it's, you've got some, um, you know, what, what 
theologians would call biblical imagination, where you have the text and then you're kind of imagining what would the scene look like, even if the text doesn't exactly tell you what it would look like. Mm -hmm. Um, So I love that about it. And I particularly love that about it because it gives that, that kind of imagination gives space for um, bringing women into the art in a way that um, the other kind of portraying Book of Mormon scenes um, really limits artists because there are so few named women in the text. Um, So if we only portray the named women, then there aren't very many artistic opportunities, right? Right. But if you kind of go into this imaginative space Mm -hmm. of women who aren't named or who were present but unacknowledged in the text, then there's almost limitless opportunities for what could be depicted. One thing I was thinking about as I looked at it is, um, you know, women and children, when they're named in the Book of Mormon, they are often named as, um, when they're named as groups, they're often Mm -hmm. named as victims of violence. Yeah. Um, You know, thinking about um, like when the Lamanites are chasing um, the people of Limhi. Yeah. um, Or the, the, during the last wars between the Lamanites and the the Nephites and, you know, the really graphic descriptions of women being forced to eat the flesh of their husbands or um, women being carried off or um, women and children being burned in Ammonihah, Mm -hmm. the city of Ammonihah. Right. So they're, they're often, um, it it often seems in the book of Mormon, like this this was a very dangerous, (laughs) dangerous society for women and children. And I, I like that this piece gives space for a peaceful moment for mm-hmm. women and children, that this is a mother and a child who are not just sort of passive victims of violence, but um, but enjoying this period of peace. And it, it kind of influences, or it, I, I guess I should say it emphasizes how important that moment of, moment of peace is for mm-hmm. this for these characters in this image, right? It kind of makes that piece more real, um, even though we have such a little bit of of text to go on. And I I think that, um, you know, the fact that it's kind of set in the golden hour Uh of of the the sunset, I think it really speaks to this fleeting moment of peace in the Book of Mormon, Mm -hmm. right? You just have this little bit of time when people aren't, struggling and running from soldiers or in the midst of battle or um or you know undergoing famine um and it's just this little beautiful moment i hadn't noticed that symbolism i love that insight so i also notice here um the women and children um are kind of dressed in sort of south american style clothing and then There's this Mesoamerican looking structure, maybe a temple. I would assume it's supposed to be like a Mayan kind of a temple, uh, pre-Columbian. And, and um, I'm just wondering how, how, how do you think that works or doesn't work in this image? Yeah. So I think it's something that um, artists need to be very careful about, Um, particularly when, you know, it's white artists who are depicting brown people. Um, you know, it's not an impossible thing, but it is something to be very sensitive toward. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I the the LDS Church from you know the publication of the Book of Mormon uh, interpreted the Book of Mormon to be about the ancestors of indigenous people in the Americas. Mm-hmm. And um, and that idea has been both empowering and painful mm-hmm. for Indigenous people. And I, I think we need to be very careful about that, that, that they have not felt, um, they have not connected with that narrative in a monolithic way. Okay. Um, there have been some really good scholars who have explored this, um, this idea, um, 
you know, Larry Echo Hawk, Farina King. So it's definitely something to be careful about and to be thoughtful about as we, you know, as we think about the Book of Mormon and as we portray images from the Book of Mormon. Yeah, I agree. I actually looked up the, um, in the new, the church's topics and questions section, and they have one on Book of Mormon geography. And I'll just read here. It says, the church's only position is that the events the Book of Mormon describes took place in the ancient Americas, but they don't want to say whether it was North America or Central or South America. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very helpful. And I think it's also guiding um, and responding to scholarship that you see now about the Book of Mormon, which is less about, um, you know, sort of proving certain historicity or, uh, you know, geographic place and more about what kind of truths can we learn Mm. from the text. Yeah, I think this is also an interesting point about how artists are often having to make choices in the art. And just like you said, the women aren't necessarily in the text, but we know they're there. And so the artist is imaginative in, in depicting them. It's kind of the same here where we don't know exactly where these events happened. And so the artist has to put them somewhere. And so this particular artist has has chosen um, these sort of Mayan um, symbols. Um, and that's one choice, but it maybe isn't the only, the only, I mean, it certainly isn't the only way to depict it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, this, this image um, would probably elicit many different reactions from indigenous people of, you know, of indigenous LDS people of, you know, feeling um, like it, it really speaks to them and it connects them to their, their ancestry and some feeling like, Mm -hmm. you know, this, this is not how they imagine their ancestors. Yeah. So, and, and I do, I do love the art because of the way um, it depicts this beautiful moment in, in the history that we want to aspire to this kind of community. Do you have any other thoughts on the interaction of the family depicted here? Yeah. I, I think it's actually really beautiful that the child in front of the mother is a girl. And of course the baby is, you know, non-identifiable. <laughs> um, there, the, the women in the Book of Mormon are so sparse and there are very few interactions between women, right? There's, there's Abish and the Lamanite queen. Mm-hmm. Um, off the top of my head, I'm struggling to come up with another one. <laughs> <laughs> You come on the scene, it's usually interacting with men. Right. And I think this is a really nice moment of a mother mm-hmm. and a girl, a woman and a girl, um, and they're having their own sort of private conversation. And this is their space. And it, it feels very much claimed to mm-hmm. their space. You look at where the light is coming from, and it's around the mother's head, mm-hmm. Um and it feels like they belong here and they're living without fear and this is their story. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and just building on the chapters that had come at the end of Third Nephi where Christ has um, really laid out the, his doctrine of faith and repentance and baptism and the Holy Ghost and um, enduring to the end. And and I see this mother passing that on to her daughter here and continuing that that tradition of, of conversion um, and discipleship. Margaret, thank you so much for talking with me today about this piece. Thank you. This is really delightful and what an amazing project. Thanks and good luck in Divinity School. Thank you.